Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. A woman in Harlem embraces her pregnancy while she and her family struggle to prove her fiancé innocent of a crime. Based on the novel by James Baldwin, Barry Jenkins returns with If Beale Street Could Talk, tonight on the Four Seasons of Film podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Four Seasons of Film podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Robert Blackburn. Joining me, as always, is Scotty Brown. Hello, Scotty. Hey. It is Oscar season again. And I think we said that already this um, this season, but last night was the Golden Globes, and they, they weren't the Golden Globes. They actually were <laughs> the Golden Globes <laughs> this year for me. I uh, felt good about what happened last night, but I will not elaborate on why or why I did feel good because I'm going to wait till the Oscars get announced in what is uh, sure to be an exciting Academy Awards year, awards season year, um, if they're deciding to go a certain way. For all you listeners out there, you're just going to have to wait for an elaboration on what that means. But needless to say, tonight's episode, If Beale Street Could Talk, was the last movie on my list that I really needed to see before I could... I, I know we did our top five on the TV show, but this was one I, I kept thinking, man, I, I can't really do my top five unless I see If Beale Street Could Talk, because I was thinking it might be in contention to be one of my favorites of the year. The name Barry Jenkins just came out of nowhere for me. Did it for you? Yeah. I mean, when Moonlight came out, it ended up being one of my favorites of that year. I was so glad that it... Uh, I wasn't glad for the controversy at the Oscars. I was just glad it did win, ultimately, Best right. Picture that year. In a lot of ways, I felt like that sort of hurt the Oscars more because it seemed like it was very gimmicky. And even to this day, I kind of think it was still staged. The whole, like, yeah. uh, we got the envelope wrong thing. Jimmy Kimmel, like, behind the scenes, you know, like, playing the ultimate practical <laughs> joke. And he'll say, like, on his deathbed or when he re retires from TV that it was all, you know, planned. I don't know, something like that. It just sure. cheapened... It already feels like a cheap sh this, uh, ceremony, but that cheapened it more for me <laughs> when I was watching it. It was like the, the the gratings grab. But nonetheless, when Moonlight was announced the winner, I was I was very happy because I really loved that film. I revered that film for a lot of ways, um, most notably because this guy did not fall on my radar and he turned into a movie that was so uh, moving, like Moonlight. And though, you know, when when you you discover a new director that for me I loved his visual style and his his cinematic choices and uh, just the way he made Moonlight look and made his actors look in Moonlight it felt like a director with real style and you don't get that so much these days you get a director or directors that turn in a film that's you know kind of paint by numbers or you know in in a lot of ways I was thinking about last night movies are just becoming one big montage. And even when I watched Barry Jenkins' movie, Moonlight, it seemed like there was a, an artist here behind the camera who knew the medium a little bit better than most directors. So I'm very excited to see if Beale Street could talk his follow-up. I went back and looked at his, his IMDb and his credits. I have not seen anything else by him, but I think he only made one other feature besides tonight's movie and then uh, Moonlight. And, you know, it was, it was set in San Francisco, too, yeah. which I read I really wanted to see. Now I really want to see that because it did make a little bit of a splash. But where did this guy learn to direct, direct like this? I forget. <laughs> I remember last year when he came out, he went to like, film school and all that, took right? time off, went over to like Europe and things like that. Like, oh, he had his own, like, that space. makes sense then. Yeah. Uh, he's a classic guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, from bow tie up to down. He's always dressed nice <laughs> and he always is well spoken. He loves independent film and film in general. He just he's an anomaly figure because he makes seemingly with no experience really. I mean, it's it's like Orson Welles came out and made Citizen Kane. It was so stylish and he, it seemed like he knew the medium so well. And Barry Jenkins... He has with, a great DP, too, that he's worked with uh, as well. So. Orson, Orson Welles? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, uh, Barry Jenkins. Yeah, absolutely. Laxton, so. Unbelievable. But just the pacing and the montage of his uh, his choices, you know, where he'll stop and breathe a little bit in that non-Terrence Malick way where we're not going to whisper over this, but when he gives <laughs> those, those wonderful close-ups of his actors where you just kind of read into the single shot and 
in Beale Street, he he really takes his style to a a bigger level because in a lot of ways, I don't know how much Moonlight was shot for, but it seemed like a very small budget movie, was it? I think so. Yeah, I would yeah, imagine so. Was big. <laughs> but uh, so effective, and the movie like that winning Best Picture, that, I, just, I was just so proud to be a filmmaker when when that won. Um, so cut to James Baldwin's novel of Beale Street could talk, set in the 1960s in New York City. People know the show like to, uh, they, they probably know that I don't like to watch trailers and I don't like to read synopsis before movies. Um, I'll get early buzz and early, you know, a little blurb of what things are about, but it tended to, I don't like to give too much away, in, especially in this day and age when everything is given away before you go see anything. Um, so if Beale Street Could Talk had early buzz just because it was Barry Jenkins returning and I found out it was in the 60s and it was uh, it was based on James Baldwin's novel of the same name. So immediately I wanted to see it as, as soon as it came out and it didn't get that. I don't know when it came out. Christmas Day? Is that when this came out? I think so. Yeah. So it, I didn't see it then. It's been a while. I, and the weird thing, we live in the San Francisco Bay, but we didn't really get it out here close enough until recently. Yeah. So, I mean, I had to sort of shelve this one for my top five list and for the TV show and for the, for our review of it. So the anticip- anticipation was was growing fierce. So going into today, it's one of those podcasts where I saw it today, this afternoon, and I knew we had the podcast, and I wish that I had seen it on Friday instead of Monday. Because it's, it's one of those ones I just wish I had a little bit more time to process. Yeah, I just got out of it, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was... The strange thing for me was I'm watching the movie, and um, I usually... I usually leave the the theater and I talk to someone, you know, about what I've seen. I talk to myself even about what I've seen. And I don't want to say that uh, I felt sad when I walked out, but it it felt like it. the theme of the movie, which is sort of, um, I, I wouldn't even say the theme is racism and corruption, but it felt like that was the theme. But it also felt like the sadness that I was feeling from the film's intention was just kind of like, for humanity, almost like on a bigger level, the theme of the movie made me sad because I always think the same thing when when I see a movie with this sort of theme or tone, and I think I can't believe the world was ever this way, and I can't believe it still is this way too. So it's yeah. almost like there's no hope, <laughs> or you know, <laughs> or maybe there is hope because we're having these 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 conversations about race, and we have the, these exposés on what race used to be like. And then it, t- it took me back to a film like uh, Do the Right Thing, where Spike Lee presented racism and xenophobia uh, and culture from many points of view. And that's, the, that's one of the things I love about Do the Right Thing. You had every walk of life in Brooklyn at that time, that storefront, you know, on that block, and you heard their opinion on what was going on and where they weighed in on things. And so immediately that's what I... Re- this movie reminds me of that in tone, but not really the opinion part. There wasn't a lot of, you know, yeah. walk a mile in everyone's shoes. It was walk a mile in in these people's shoes during this, you know, terrible time for them to live in New York City. And, you know, there's there's so many things to touch on. We're just, we're just going to have to see where it goes because... Sure, we can talk about the race issue in this. We can talk about... I thought it was unbelievable the expose of family at the beginning of the film. And then, that was the best scene, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was so raw and so real, and you never really... I guess that's why he's such a great director. He, he shows us the real more, even in, in the two films I've seen of his. Moonlight felt so real watching it mm. that it makes you uncomfortable at the, at the uncomfortable situations more than any other film. That, that shows similar themes or, or similar actions. And in this way, also, you feel like these people are real and we're getting a, a snapshot, a snippet in time of what they're going through. And I feel so bad. I feel so uncomfortable. And I feel helpless because I can't do anything about it. But it's almost like my mom used to say, I don't like to go see sad movies. I love seeing sad movies. I love seeing uncomfortable movies. This one made me very, very deeply sad. I don't, and that's just the first thing I'm taking away seeing it today. Did it make you sad? 
Um, not really. I think on that front, it was what I expected it to be. I didn't know, you don't really know what the story is going to end up saying by the end of it. You're on this journey with this couple who's pregnant, or this this young girl who's pregnant. Her hus- her lover is uh, in jail for a crime he most likely did not do. The reaction to her families and just her trying to go through the streets every day and do all this kind of stuff. It's set in the backdrop of the 60s. Yeah, I mean, it was sad, but it just, it felt... I don't know. It, it wasn't explosive or anything for me. Right. There was, that was the I, I same mean, way I felt. Or anything like that. It was just, it, it felt, and it's not a knock on the movie, it just, but it, it didn't, it didn't feel real. It didn't feel staged, but it just felt like this is what you're, this is what he was doing. Yeah. It's like he perfectly executed the movie he wanted to make, but it wasn't like, um, remember the movie Fences with Denzel? That yeah. year where it was kind of, it, you could tell it was a stage play right. and it was sort of, you had the same dynamic of family and the uncomfortableness I was just talking about. And th- it was sort of the great build up to the great letdown there. This one seemed more of kind of like a vivid dream when you were watching it. You know, it's kind of like I'm, I'm recalling certain scenes here. You're rooting for the, the right people. It was just, it was such a, can I say strange film? Yeah, it yeah. It felt thought, strange. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was like... There's a lot going on with the journey with the couple. And then at a certain point, you get the mother involved with the with Fonny, who's the boyfriend, The his case. He's in prison, but she gets involved with the lawyer. Right. But you're also going through flashbacks with this couple where you're seeing them as children fall in love for the first time. Then you're seeing them grow to the, as a couple together, getting a loft, and before they had love for the first time, so before the baby was being born. And then it's a broken up narrative and it's kind of all over the place, but it's uh, kind of just beautiful. <laughs> I guess that's what saves the movie for me too. Like I, I totally agree. It's story wise, it is kind of all over the place, but it has a through line where you follow. Oh, okay. I guess I, I guess I'm just on this journey. I'm yeah. not. I'm not really going for narrative here. I'm just going. I hope the guy didn't do it, and I hope he gets out of jail, and I hope her pregnancy is okay. So so there's your narrative, and there's your traditional screenplay, and I, I like those aspects of it. The visual style, I think, is my favorite part. I like his, mm. I like him as a director. I think he is insanely talented, and it's so effortless and simple, his choices, single shots and staying on... Uh, uh, on people's faces very close. Mm-hmm. He does a lot of low angle shots in this movie that I really like that people don't tend to put their actors in because they're it's not the most flattering angle in the world. His pastels or his color palette in the film was unbelievable. I love the tone of colors that he gave us in this movie. I just think if this is his DP, then his DP you know needs to get the credit but i have to believe that his vision as a director especially given that i've seen both of these movies he has a very clear cut vision on how he wants to present his movies through editing and through his uh through his cinematographer and i might even say he's one of the best directors working today just because i've i've seen these two films just from that take away story take away you know yeah. all that just the actual look of these these movies and the the style i don't see many directors doing this anymore i mean it, it's almost like my you know my favorite directors kubrick had a definite style the coen brothers have a definite style you can see you know it's always that if you put on a movie it was, it was a test somebody said years ago you can you can tell certain directors by just the look and feel of their movies and that's what I've always liked about them. It's almost like turning the sound off on a on a film, and you can tell if it's a good story just by watching it without any sound. Style is the same way. I respect directors more and love more directors, even unknowingly, until I realize this point, where the, the more their style comes off of the screen and hits you in the face, the more respect I have for them, because they, it's so hard to get a clear-cut vision of what your style is is like a stand-up comedian they would say your style chooses you i don't believe that's true in directing a hundred percent i think you try to choose a style and you try to get it up there and it's it's like a sculpture you're chipping away at sometimes it looks like uh you know a a beautiful statue that could be in the louvre or sometimes it looks like you silly putty mr potato head or something you know and I, I can't believe this guy has only made three features he's made some shorts i i read you know that that he he's got practice or or developed his craft through but definitely a born director barry jenkins excited to see where he's gonna go and i'm sad to say i can't really 
speak to the movie so much because I'm still trying to process it. <laughs> I don't know whether it was one of my favorites of the year. I don't know that uh, uh, I I'm, could be very critical of it at this point. It's sort of, I don't know if this is what you're saying, but it kind of just exists. I could, Yeah, I mean, I could be, criti- I mean, yeah, story-wise, I can be critical of the movie. It leaves you hanging in a lot of places, and there's some unnecessary ventures that you go into where it's like, well, I'd rather just see this part of the movie and see the couple and not so much the mom going to Puerto Rico. Yeah. And a situation which, you know, it's fine to not resolve certain things. That was kind of the, that was probably the biggest explosive thing at the, at the end of the movie was you, re- you realize, oh, shit, we're never going to resolve any of this. And that was kind yeah. of the point. It's just this couple who's in this situation, and now it's going to be stretched out into this you know, the kid's life, um, the passage of time is shown through her belly and her growth with the child. And then by the end of the movie, it's a, it's a child visiting his dad in prison. You kind of go, Oh, that's kind of the, mm. <laughs> the, the, the life for, for this kid's generation. And you kind of re you know, that through street that they were talking about in that quote at the beginning of the movie kind of hits you. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to say it's a beautiful mess, but, uh, it's a beautiful, uh, it is, it is a very, it is a good movie. Yeah, I, I, I it's in there. Seriously, don't want to deny that it's in there somewhere. It's a very good movie. I uh, yeah, I I wouldn't say it would be you know like on my. I wouldn't, it wouldn't make my list. I wouldn't change it to add it to add this one to it. But yeah. it was a fine. It's a finely made film. I think that in, in and acted too. In, oh, on un, yeah, unbelievably acted because I, I had no idea who these people were except for, for the most I think part, Regina yeah. King. Yeah, 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 I think she's yeah she's the, the most well name. known in it. Uh, everyone else was so fantastic. Their performances are so fantastic. And speaking. To the greater point of the picture, you know, the, the mass incarceration of African Americans in in our culture, it seemed like, I mean, you, you started out saying, you know, stating, giving these pictures and stating these facts. So you sort of go, oh, man, this is this is going to be a very big film, heavy film here. And then by the end of it, like you were saying, with the unresolved issues, you kind of just realize that, you know, this was a bigger and still is a bigger epidemic than anybody cares to really talk about or fix yeah. And maybe that's the entire point of the movie is it is sad because look at how this person, these people's lives were ruined by just this this huge wrong that's so easy to commit. It's it was it seems like it's so easy for people in power just to go in and essentially just like fuck up your day and then your life is fucked up for the not only your life, your wife's life, your parents' life, yeah. her parents' life everybody's life just because you have a baton and a badge and you totally could be an asshole or at the 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 law firm with the the guy's lawyer where they they cut to him and he's like you know she's near narr- the i think i forget her name in the movie but she's narrating basically but he's right. basically being told by the the partners or the higher up in the building like you know, don't 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 yeah. spend so much time on this case or don't yeah. invest don't send a team down to puerto rico to get the girl to get her testimony don't do any of this stuff. It's not worth it. And we don't really want to be associated with the, with this kind of a case. Um, I guess. So you see that from on the fronts? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, it was kind of a weird, like, conspiratorial kind of a thing that they almost went back a little too far to see, like, where the strings are being pulled, but not far enough to see really what's going on. Right. But then you have the obvious stuff with the the, race, the cop who's uh, pops up every once in a while. Boy, he was scary as shit. <laughs> Man, yeah. whoever that cop was, he commend him because he really scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Nobody wanted to move in the theater. Because you thought he might be coming through the screen at you. Ugh. Gotta say, though, Dave Franco. Only thing about the movie that I, I was really... Why? Really. It just hurt. <laughs> it hurt. As soon as he turned Dave, around, I went, what And he did fuck? fine. It wasn't, you know? yeah, it's not a bad but scene, it's, but... It's, still, it's just Dave, Dave Franco. Franco. <laughs> what are you doing to us, Barry? <laughs> that's oh. that's but one fault as a director. That's, a <laughs> that's, your, fish eye, that's your fish eye lens. <laughs> big fault. The guy's not a, a terrible actor, but he's just so out of place. You can't put him in that. It's like seeing Brad Pitt's name come up at the end of the movie. I'm exactly. Like, Fuck. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, just look what he's done. <laughs> look at that one movie, Vince Vaughn. <laughs> okay. I kept seeing oh either something from Neighbors where he's talking about his dick or doing something right. in that scene. And I'm like, you're a Jewish guy giving a couple of break. I should be more joyous for this scene. But Oh, yeah. That was a huge misstep in the movie, and I wish that never happened. Um, but the result of, of that character, which could have, should have been played by somebody else, was yes. great for the couple. I know. <laughs> so it was a good moment. kind of like, funny. oh, well, fantastic. <laughs> oh, but Dave Franco ruins everything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know whether I would have rather James in that role or not. No, no Franco. No Franco. <laughs> no Franco. Franco Nero. Mm-mm. Yeah, yeah. I kept thinking, too. That scene had to wear off of me. I missed so much of the movie after he was there. I kept thinking, he won't be back, right? Yes. Like, that was it? But that was long enough? Oh, I know. It was, a, it was a conundrum of a scene to put that in there. 
I'm not used to a movie that presents you with such a huge systemic problem and doesn't give you kind of kind of like a solution. It's just basically we brought this up just right. to, to bring this up and put it out there that this was wrong. This this still is wrong. What are we going to do about it? That's really not up for me as a movie maker to tell you. You you just go out and I'm painting a portrait of time that that you can make similar cases to you know, to now and then, but it doesn't give you a whole lot besides a huge pill to swallow and say, "Holy shit. Look how messed up this was." I mean, and and this was just one guy in jail, you know. Yeah, one story. Oh yeah. my. <laughs> Think about everyone's story, you know, all these wrongful oh, incarcerations. That's why I mean the scope of the movie is so huge because it's it's basically remember the end of Black Klansman when Spike Lee sort of goes into Ferguson and the Trump thing and the where we are right now. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, Charlottesville. And that sort of was like, look where we are, you know, from his point of view, look how things are, look, look how fucked up things are. You just watched the movie set in the past, but right. here it is. In here it is in world. your face. Yeah. And this today, one yeah. instead is kind of like, set the movie in the 60s, this was going on, draw your own conclusions for why I did this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of badass now that I think about it. It doesn't give you an easy answer, but that's also why... I really never liked Michael Moore's movies too. And I call them movies because I don't think they're documentaries. Um, <laughs> I don't like them because he, ne he does a whole healthcare thing, but then he doesn't, what do we do about it now? Vote. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> I want to know an answer. This, but that's why we get on a boat. We go down to Guantanamo Bay and we yell in a megaphone. <laughs> and I get it. We're supposed to all be in the streets, you know, yelling for what we want. But there, there has to be an answer to this stuff. You can't just bring it up, grab my, you know, ticket sale money and say next movie. But in this case, in Barry Jenkins, I think you can because this is art and this is actually a movie. Michael Moore is kind of, you yeah. know, making a, <laughs> a dramatic point, you know, for himself and for his political uh, ideology. And that's fine also because that, that's the business he's in. But filmmaking and actual narrative movies like this, it stuns me when I have, uh, I have no answers. Did you ever see The Learning Tree? No, remind it was 1969. Me. It was the first studio movie to be back that was directed by an African American. But it's basically these two boys. I almost, I guess, you could say they both have what could be like a black male experience, almost. Uh, but they're two different roads in 1920s um, Kansas. But uh, again, it's not really to tell you anything other than to show you this is what some people's experiences are. You have the one kid who's kind of accepted by white society, but not really. And the other kid who's kind of the troublemaker and his dad's a drunk. So he's kind of the scum and always getting arrested in and out of mm -hmm. prison and all that kind of stuff. Sounds good. But um, yeah, again, it but it just brings up all these issues without any real resolution or any real um any kind of thing. It's just saying this is uh, this is the, this like, almost like that quote at the beginning that they start yeah. you the the James Baldwin quote they start you out with the beginning of the movie. It's very the sad, powerful. It's very strong. The sadness comes out of there for me because what what am I really expecting? And then it got better. No, I, I know, it yeah, didn't yeah. get better. And then he was it, released from prison. No, and, no. and I kept <laughs> you thinking, can't do that. I kept thinking the whole time he's going to get out. He's, <laughs> I hope he gets out. Ooh, he's not going to get out. Oh no, this is not good. Yeah, and and I was I guess that's just your optimism going into a movie. This is not Green Book. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know, There's no like, family dinner is, that we're all going to sit yeah, down to. And yeah. We're, we're <laughs> this, yeah. I, and I love Green Book, but it's but they're two thing. very different. You, you movies. look they're at very them different. and you go, one is based in reality, and one is made for more of an audience to telling go you, yeah. see. You know, <laughs> and and sadly, that's why Beale Street is not going to be as successful at the box office as Green Book. But I would say Beale Street is better art than Green Book for sure. Yeah, you oh, know, yeah. he it it in terms of as filmmakers, hands down, you look at. You look at this film and go, this is a unbelievably well well sculpted piece of film art that will last for decades as a historical artifact almost or or insight into a bygone era that we can always go back and say, look what we can learn from this time. Look what we are learning and what, look what we haven't learned. Green Book, if you want to compare the two again, it's look how we should be. <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, and and look at you know how how things always work out. Yeah, I mean, you know? yeah, it was just somebody overcame their racism and things like that. So it was a hopeful yeah. story. <laughs> it was it was hopeful, but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, I I hate to keep comparing this movie to 
other movies that were similar in in tone and but you know it that's kind of the, the charge. It was an issue this year. It was yeah, a topic. It's kind of like I mean, that's, that's kind the of the charge point, of the, the season this year. <laughs> yeah. It's where we, Hollywood is always bringing to the forefront whatever political insight they want to bring up for the year is made very apparent. I don't know who chooses it by committee or just that that's the time, that's the, that's the sign of the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't, they, and somehow we always get here to the end of the year and you can see four or five films that are in contention for, for being Oscar movies and they all have very similar themes and very similar goings on. I, I always wanted to be the filmmaker that goes and and, and uh, conquers, you know, some kind of change in society. But at the same time, people are doing it so much better than me already. <laughs> you know, I, I think I'll just stay st stick with my genre and, you know, make film noirs again and comedies. And, and that's okay for me, I've realized, because you know, I'm I'm not the guy that's going to go out either and write something that's personal about you know something that happened to me and my father when when we were growing up or something because <laughs> that's just not that's not kind of the stories I want to tell. Yeah. I want to I don't want to be Steven Spielberg, but I want to tell movies that are entertaining, fun, and deep. You know, and the deep parts why I'm not doing Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> Sad to say, uh, this, it's going to be it's going to be a weird it's going to be a weird one to try to. I, I can't believe we did the podcast and I'm kind of actually ashamed we did this one. So uh, seeing the movie and then going right into the podcast. But as you can tell out there in, in listener land, it's a, uh, it's one that kind of stumps you and you think, <laughs> oh, wow, holy shit. This one has so much room for discussion, but I think it has room for discussion by and with the filmmakers. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like, you know, uh, I, I came up with this idea that I want to do on the TV show where it's called Critique the Critics, and we take one review where we totally disagree with that person, and then we critique their review and why we disagree with it. And that's that's sort of, maybe we'll lead off with this one. Take one we were like, no, they totally got this wrong on why they did or did not like this movie. It, does, it, it just it matters on what we think of their review mm. and sort of strike back, because we're not critics on this show. We're kind of, it's kind of like we just want to have discussion on the art of the movie, you know, yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't get my jollies by coming out and thinking my opinion is so great and saying yes, this movie was this bad for these follow reasons. It is was, was so great by these following reasons. You know, it. I'd rather just talk about the art of film instead of critiquing a movie week to week just to sell newspapers, even if they exist anymore. I'm not even sure. But Beale Street is is one of those movies where. I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of critics love this movie, but I would love to read the critics that hated this movie <laughs> to see what they say because you know I think I love the movie, but I want to see I want to read somebody that's critical of it and see if I agree or disagree because hopefully they took two or three days before they they wrote this thing, <laughs> which is a luxury I did not have. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I just think the the beauty of the movie, the acting of the movie, is what did it for me. Yeah, just him as a director. I think those three things. I watched the movie before Oscars. I'm sure it'll be up for Oscars. But Regina King win the Golden Globe. She'll, you know, sure. she'll probably be on that stage for supporting. Um, but definitely a second viewing is is in the cards for me. You? Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to watch this again. And uh, yeah, I think this movie. I think it's one of those that uh, I. You know, you feel a certain way the first time you watch it, but I think I'll, I'll watch it again and I'll watch it probably a few more times and it'll it just, e sense. each time it'll just get a different, um, it'll just settle in a little bit more. It's like a great, it's like a great book. It's like a novel that way. Yeah, I really wanted to stay with different people in this more too. I know we followed the young girl and it was really her journey and, you know, because he's incarcerated. So mm -hmm. it's their relationship you're following, but I was really enamored with the father, the two fathers' journeys, and I the other family. Didn't see enough of the other family. Yeah. There's that one scene, and it's pretty explosive, and you can tell that one side feels one way about the other side, and the other right. side's not afraid to bite back either. But there's really, that's really the only scene they have. You never see as, them as a again. family. You never see the the sisters and the mother again. The yeah. two fathers have the scene at the bar, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 there, there was a lot more I could have used from uh, some of the other uh, angles and less of some of the other sides. It they seems like to. it could have been a, a great ensemble picture, but it, you know, instead it was, uh, it was kind of just the the love story about the the two that were in a relationship, mm -hmm. which I liked also. But I wanted to go in other directions. I think that's why it was such a beautiful movie, and I really enjoyed it. 
but I wanted to go somewhere else, but I wasn't I, the director. It's also weird, too, though. I mean, we start at the beginning of the movie, the big, not really problem or crisis, but it's uh, this girl's pregnant and she's not, you know, wealthy. She's not <laughs> edu- not college educated. You know, it's at a time where, you know, it's just you're a young girl who's been knocked, basically knocked up. Right. But that you think that's going to be the big drama, but then it's, oh, no, there's the father story and then there's yeah. their lives together in this town and this times and all this it, it it starts out very simple but it just gets more complicated and more deep into everything that they go through in their lives not just the pregnancy right oh it's one that uh again we'll come back and and by the end of the year and you'll you'll hear us talking differently about it i bet <laughs> but right now it's uh it's scotty's quote not mine it's a beautiful mess I'll decide whether it's a beautiful mess or if it's a it's like a Picasso. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to slide the tiles around on it, mm, like a like a, one of those games when I was a kid. But uh, thank you very much, Scotty Brown. If Beale Street could talk, what would it say? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a uh, I guess that's an answer that our listeners are going to have to develop for themselves. But that's what I kept thinking. If Beale Street could talk, that's a, that's a hell of a. I love the title, it's a good title. but. I don't know what it would say. <laughs> Not yet. Mm. If Beale Street could talk, watch another time. Listen to it again. You know, something about that. Just return and, and see what you think for yourselves. Because you stumped me on this one. But uh, I think they get the gist of it. Something hit us in the face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Scotty Brown, I will see you next week for another exciting edition of the Four Seasons of Film podcast. See ya. And for myself, Nathan Robert Blackburn, check us out on fourseasonsoffilm.com for all your podcast needs. And the uh, new uh, TV show is up on Thursdays on Vimeo. Our uh, Best of 2018 show is up where Scotty and I give you both of our top five movies of 2018. Check those out on the website also if you'd like, and also on Vimeo to hear us discuss those top five movies of 2018. And keep film alive. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Four Seasons of Film podcast.